Hey, Arpin. Back out to one. How you doing? I'm so happy to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. happy yeah. to see you too. So, uh, <laughs> welcome everybody. Welcome to the uh, Basu and Gade Notebook. Uh, a bit of a later edition compared to, uh, you know, usually. Uh, well, we sometimes we record at all all times of the day, depending on the news and and our respective availability and we we try to do as best as we can and you know as long as we have our episode recorded on monday and the other one on, on friday mission accomplished but it's not always easy <laughs> no so this week's episode is basically going to be about Marc antoine's weekend it's not going to be about we're not going to delve into all sorts of what well, we are going to talk about the canadians obviously but i mean Marc antoine's weekend i think um it's a nice little window into into the profession. So, um, so basically, what we're going to go in kind of reverse order, but a quick summary of Marc Antoine's weekend. So on Friday, he was in Burlington, Vermont, to go watch Lane Hudson play with Boston University against the University of Vermont. Mm. Continued on Saturday to Boston, where the Canadians got just yeah, we curb, were, I, curb stomped. I, I, okay, keep going. Yeah, I'll interrupt that. Well, <laughs> Canadians got curb stomped by the Bruins. And then as he's in Boston, the Islanders out of nowhere uh, hire um, Patrick Waugh to be their head coach. And so he, uh, you know, hauls ass down to Elmont, New York, on the outskirts of Queens um, to catch Patrick Waugh's debut as the coach of the Islanders. And now uh, today drove back from New York in order yeah. to get back and literally just walked in the door as we're recording this podcast. So I think in this episode, we're going to touch on all those, all three of those things sort of in, <laughs> in reverse, in reverse chronological order, but just generally speaking, mm. how was your weekend? <laughs> that was fun. I yeah. had a great weekend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's fun to be in the, in, as Marty says, in the trenches, you know, in the thick yeah. of things where, where things are happening. I think that sometimes for a guy who's covering the Canadians, it's nice to write a non-Canadians related story. It's uh -huh. a good, you know, it's a breath of fresh air. And I had two breaths of fresh air because, you know, Hudson, I mean, I, I know Lane and uh, I've, I've talked to him before and I've seen him before. I wrote about him before, but it's not the day-to-day -day stuff that you'd get in Brassard. So it's a nice, nice little change. Uh -huh. So, but it's just the volume, the distances, the lack of sleep, the and in, at Radio Canada also the thing is I just I don't just write right so uh, I'll do you radio got, you, got, you got radio yeah I got I can have the the occasional TV hit uh, mm -hmm. it it could be could be endless right so uh, did you have a did you have a camera with you this weekend no or you did, no you did no, no. on the phone I did I, I did yeah I, I actually I did TV uh, on FaceTime on FaceTime yeah exactly yeah okay. if I had brought all my gear. It would have been easy because maybe we could have done this pod earlier in the day. But you were at Canadians practice today, so I was at Canadians practice today. Yes, and you didn't know that you would be going to New York on Sunday when you left. So it's it's only That's natural it. that you didn't have your podcasting gear. But so let's so so again, as we mentioned, we want to go at this in reverse order. And I think the you know the hiring of Patrick Waugh is not. Um, is not without interest to no. our listeners and uh, Canadians fans in general. He's going to be in Montreal on Thursday, uh, you know, which uh, is perfect. Amazing uh, should be amazing timing. Um, I think there were several of our colleagues who did the same thing as you, right? Go went from Boston to New York at the last second to cover mm. this. And so, um, you know, paint the, paint the scene a little bit, you know, it's, it's been a while since we've seen Patrick in this theater. He seems like a bit of a humbled version of his former self that, that it took so long for him to come back. But what is, what was the vibe like in that room after that morning skate? Um, how many of there were you? Um, yeah. I saw someone point out that he took questions for nine minutes in English and seven minutes in French. And they found that unusual. And I was like, well, what planet do you come from? <laughs> like, how do you find that unusual? But what was it like right. uh, being, being in the room with Pat for Patrick was first uh, in person availability as an NHL coach and first time in seven years. Well, okay, let's talk about him first. So Patrick yeah. Roy, because it's he's more interesting than the reporters. <laughs> but yes. Patrick Roy uh, himself is seems so so happy and delighted to go 
to come back in the the environment that he loves, an environment where he's thrived before, and mm -hmm. let's let's say it, it uh, the environment where he belongs too. Uh, it's been it, it was a seven year itch for him, uh, a long long wait uh, to to get back into uh, into this position. Uh, so he's been it's it, it's a sort of a purgatory in a sense, you know, to be uh, to be put in doubt by pretty much the whole hockey community after you know leaving uh, leaving the Colorado Avalanche in abrupt fashion. A month leaving them the high season. and dry, high and dry. I really, I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. And I think and, and I think he recognizes that now. Yeah, and I think when you mentioned, you know, humble. That's part of it. I think that he he regrets some of the things that he did back then, and and the way that he left is certainly on top of the list. Because I don't think that it's necessarily the coaching, how he managed the Colorado Avalanche, even though he was a rookie at the NHL level, and he probably made rookie mistakes uh, in in that situation. But I don't think it's the coaching as much as how it had ended that really created a stigma and made it so that. In the eyes of so many teams, he must not have been considered all that trustable. Um, so, hence that that purgatory. That I feel like he would he had stopped waiting for a phone call, but he had been waiting for that phone call for a long time. So he's happy to be there. Very exciting. Very, very excited. Very energetic. Uh, for the morning skate, man, he was screaming, waving his stick all around, uh, giving indications, talking to the French players on the ice in French, like, uh, oh, like yeah? telling, <laughs> yeah, like telling Samuel Bolduc, no, no, ça c'est pas ta job. It's not your <laughs> job to do that. And, and he was calling Jean Gabriel Pajot, Jean Gabriel, and Pajot told us after the game, he says, I think that some of my teammates don't even know that my full name is Jean Gabriel. So <laughs> anyway, so, so super intense. And the guys were like, whoa, okay, what's going on here this morning? Because Lane Lambert was completely the opposite. Right. Uh, he was a guy that was very subdued, very calm, but you can, you can tell that the, the players needed a spark because it was, um, it was a room that, that was, uh, That that needed to be lit, right? The fire has uh, had gone instinct pretty much. They were going; their season was going down the drain or heading in very in a bad direction. Mm -hmm. So he and 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 you know, Patrick is just a character. He's good for the game. He's good for it's. It's yeah. good to have him there. And uh, so he was. Well, I'm just, disappointed he didn't. I'm disappointed he didn't pick a fight with uh, with <laughs> Pete DeBoer. Like that's what I was looking for. Is you have to be yeah. consistent. Oh. Your first game back after seven years. Do the same thing as your first game back then, you know, and, and go after no, no. the divider, pick a fight with DeBoer, start yelling at him. Yeah. I, was, I, I was disappointed in, in the lack of that. It's actually, he has to show that he's changed, right? And as he's evolved, guess, he, you'll have to show that. You have to show that strategically speaking. You'll have to <laughs> mm -hmm. show that also in terms of controlling his emotions. But at the same time, he cannot completely change who he is. I mean, He, he walked behind the bench for so much, so much last night, going to uh, yell at one guy, go give instructions to another and going this left, right, left, right all the time. And, and Bo Horvat after the game said, somebody give him a Fitbit. I'm curious to, to see his, what's to it. count his steps. Yeah. I'm <laughs> curious to know his, his step count. So, <laughs> uh, so, so it was a bit too much and he was all completely red in the face, but I was told by the junior guys that were covering the ramparts who, made the trip to to New York that right. that's his that's his big night face uh but you know it's it's not too uncommon so if he's got right, but he's not he's like that every game no but no, he gets carried away by emotion in in intense moments that it'll look as though he's ready to have a heart attack behind the bench yeah <laughs> so yeah but i agree with you that it is good for the game to have him back and it's yeah. and he is he is a character and obviously in this province Uh, among this fan base, he's always been linked. Any, anytime any job comes up, whether it's the GM job that Ken Hughes eventually got, uh, whether it's uh, a coaching job, although he his name, you know, the Marte St. Louis kind of came so suddenly and out of nowhere, there wasn't much of a buildup of, oh, Patrick Quash should be coaching the Canadians. It was more for the GM position that, you know, after Jeff Gorton got hired, there was like that right. month where obviously Patrick Wall was on everyone's lips and they, he's the big candidate to be that, to fill that GM role. 
but he's always been linked to the Canadians. And so I think, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to me, um, you know, what the scene's going to be like on Thursday morning when, when they're, when they're at the bell center, um, it'll be, I, I can't, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe he's been there in passing, but I, I don't, I don't know if Patrick has been at a game since the night his jersey got retired. Is that possible? Would that might this no, be no, his no. first he's been, game? He's been there. He's been there. He's been there for since. games. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyhow, I'm pretty. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. We'll ask him. Uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll find him. out. But you know, from a Montreal Canadiens perspective, too, I think that it's of course Marty is Marty's still a, a very recent hire, mm-hmm. but uh, and I know that obviously our. Um, listeners and and people who uh you know watch this this podcast on youtube most of them are english speaking so they have their own opinion on the on the the prerequisite of having a french speaking coach but that's the reality and every any time that you have a french speaking coach who gets a job in the nhl it's one good one more candidate that you can you can throw your your his name in the hat and previously patrick roy for all sorts of reason you know, especially mentioning but because of, of the way it ended, ended in Colorado, I don't think that he, he was seriously considered by Montreal at any point. No, I don't but think if, so. But if things go well in this second time around, and he, sorts of, he has sort of a personal redemption story, proves that he's, he's a winner and it, 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 it has a positive impact also in his coaching and that he's, he, he's good at what he does. A few years down the road, Well, that would be one more guy to add to the to the the, the Montgomery, to the Tourigny, to Pascal Vincent. You know, that's that's good to have choices, to have a, at least a few options. So uh, I will I will I will point out that when I was in Zurich, Mark Crawford made a point of mentioning that he speaks French. He knew cool. where I comes from. He he even spoke a little bit of French in my presence. I was like, <laughs> I was like, that's nice, Mark. I, I even said it. I was like, it's good. That's good PR for you to speak French in front of me, the Canadian's reporter who happens to be in Zurich. So anyhow. <laughs> so subtle. So yeah, subtle. God, so subtle. He's, <laughs> he even broke it out. His wife is Francophone. He went, he did gave me the whole spiel. I'm like, yes, I'm aware. I, I know. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be really uh, an exciting day on Thursday to have him coach the Islanders. It, I'm sure that his bench, his whole team will be all fired up against Montreal mm-hmm. and that makes the upcoming week that more complicated because now the Canadians have lost badly against Ottawa they lost badly against Boston they're playing Ottawa again and that rematch they better be ready for it yeah if they were to falter and really not play up to their standards for the third game in a row and then the game after that they have to face Patrick Roy that would be a very very interesting segment of the season Yeah, but I just want to go back to the, the what you said about Patrick Roy eventually, you know, adding his name to the list of qualified candidates to coach the Canadians. And I think it's I think it is telling that he was hired by Lou Lamorello. Like I don't know if this management group like Patrick Roy can can change all he wants. He remains an old school kind of coach. Like I feel like he's gonna come in and, and really be uh I guess more in your face. He's going to be in, in your, your face. face, more motivational than tactical. Let's say, I mean, he's just not, mm-hmm. he doesn't scream modern coach to me. And he, and so you look at the, the guys running the Canadians now, obviously with Ken Hughes and Jeff Gordon, the guy they picked in Martin St. Louis, like a definite modern bet to them. Um, so yes, I mean, Patrick was technically someone who would be qualified to coach the Canadians, but it, I just get the sense that, you know, someone like, a Pascal Vincent or even an Andre Tourigny, who is also somewhat old school, but I think has some, some modern elements to how he approaches the job mm-hmm. would be probably more appealing. And Jim, Jim Montgomery being the most appealing, I guess, of the group, but um, for this management group. And then, you know, it, I think it took someone like Lou Lamorello to, to make the plunge with this guy. because if anyone can appreciate being old school it's, it's Lou, it's Lou <laughs> Lamorello yes <laughs> yeah yeah that's true but I mean Lou is is I mean as as hard a GM you know as uh as they come in the league and I think that mm-hmm. to have that sort of boss above him the, the the hierarchy is very well established it's 
indisputable, and I think that'll be good for Roy. There's also an element of Lamorello wanting his Islanders to turn things around very quickly. I don't yeah. know how long he's been hired for, but there's a, there's clearly a, a short-term element to it. There needs to be a spark right away because, I mean, not only is this team, at least on paper, not very good, mm -hmm. uh, but also Lamorello is 81 years old, and he's not yeah. necessarily – preparing a long-term transition for, you know, it's really in the era now because it's a, it's an, it's a team that has a lot of older elements to it. Um, so it's got, it's got to pay now because it's not, you're not doing this for two years from now. So what was, what was your sense? And then we'll move on to, to, to the Boston portion of your weekend, but what was your sense of, because you're, you're right. It, it, this team does have, an older bent to it. You know, there's a lot of guys locked into long-term deals. This, 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 this team's not changing anytime soon other than bringing in someone like Patrick Roy as coach. But, you know, Patrick, I think the impression is that older players won't take to him as well as maybe young impressionable players might, you know, like that he is a guy who will, who uses certain, t certain, let's say tactics to get through to players that, that maybe, you know, don't, don't go through to older guys. What was, you know, just talking to some of the players, what was, yeah, what was kind of the vibe so. that you I, got from them as far as his arrival is concerned and, yeah and, and, you know, how, just how he is as a guy, the fiery guy who was walking up and down the bench and, you know, screaming at people for the first time for the first game right yeah. off the bat. Well, the, the, the guy is so intense that I'm not sure that, Younger players have dealt with a coach that's like that, whereas the veterans mm -hmm. might might have come across a guy like that. Right. You know, I was mentioning yeah. Pajot earlier, uh, Anders Lee, or uh, you know Matt Martin. Guy, you know, older older players, uh, they've they've had a few coaches in their career. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're an a guy that's just up and coming, and it's he's either it's either your second second or third coach, or you're under 23 or whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a style that you're not used to. And the older players might be experienced enough to get a, the, their, their finger on the pulse and understand that their room need that right now because right. they have a, they have enough experience to understand what's at stake here. And the veterans, the, the, the leaders in this team that they were the happiest about it. So Barzal, uh, Barzal, Lee, Horvat, those guys. They're saying, yeah, that's that's exactly the type of energy that we need right now. So th I understand your question because usually there's a disconnect. The guys that, you know, that are set in their ways might not want to accept that. And the younger players are more impressionable. But the younger generation, they arrive being already so confident in themselves that mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how you can really, you know, create a, a, such a vivid impression on them. That it, they're, they're gonna, you gonna, they're gonna take a step back. You know, they're confident. They get there, and in some cases, they're entitled. I don't want to generalize, but some are. Uh, yeah. So it takes a lot for them to be destabilized. But as a group, I, I, I could tell that, especially in the morning after the morning skate, more than after the game, because after the game they had won and they were just relieved. But after the morning skate, so, oh, okay, that's that's really something else. Yeah. So let's move on to uh, to to Boston, stage yeah. two of your weekend, um, and obviously the Canadians losing nine four, um, second time in two trips to Boston, and actually they've, you know, Boston my has previous, become. My, yeah, whole, my previous time was November eighteen. I was there. Did you cover that game? I in did Boston not. No, November? no, no. But that was the that was the the game that really changed the Canadian season. Yeah. Um, Interesting, you know, to, to just kind of fast forward to practice on Monday, you know, I think coming out of that game in Boston on November 18th, which wasn't nearly as drastic a loss, it was 5-2. But, I mean, in terms of the, the way the game went, I feel like that game was worse than Saturday night's game. Like, I mean, Saturday night's game was a 5-4 game after two periods. It's not, as if, it's not as if the Canadians got completely blown out of the water the whole game. They were in the game. Uh, that 5-2 game in Boston, you never got the sense they were in the game at all. Like, they, no. they barely touched the puck in that game. And so... I think there was a definite sense, a different sense of urgency for Martin St. Louis coming off that game than there was on Monday. He seemed quite serene and 
recognizing that they've given up 15 goals in their last two games, not look good in either of them, but that it's not an emergency situation. It's, it's clearly was, did not have the same buzz of urgency as, uh, as the previous game in Boston did, or at least the aftermath of the previous game in Boston did. But that night, Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that Sam Montembeau came out to talk, which is rare for a goalie who gets pulled and who gives up eight goals. Um, Brendan Gallagher comes out and takes full ownership of the the mistake to, that led to the Pasternak goal to open the third period. What was your what was the vibe in the room aside from what we saw uh, on camera? I guess, but I mean, what was what what struck you from the from the reaction to that game from these guys? Two things. First, uh, accountability. You mentioned Gallagher coming out, Montalbo coming out. Um, so that's that's always a good sign when you get guys that own up to what they did. And mm -hmm. I don't even know if somebody, if a member of the media asked to speak to Gallagher and Gallagher just decided. That that's what I was wondering. There. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Because uh, if, if, yeah. uh, my colleagues had asked, actually, we, uh, I was one of them. We, we had asked for, uh, for Sean Monaghan. Uh, ah, and okay. yeah, so Monaghan was not there, probably getting treatment. Uh, and so Gallagher was there and I think that's interesting. Uh, it's, he's, he's often there after games in Boston. Uh, yeah. he's, he takes this, this rivalry to heart. Um, and yeah, so accountability was the first thing, but also to me, my, my takeaway from that was not necessarily, yes, there was a ton of execution mistakes and and letdowns breakdowns defensively uh mm. rush coverage mistakes and whatnot but <laughs> it's the it's the emotional and the mental breakdown in the third period to me that was different that we have not necessarily seen they gave all up. that much it, they gave up and that's exactly the words yeah. that's exactly the words that montambo used in french he said we gave up yeah and, on yeah on a abandonné. on a abandonné, yeah that's it yeah And uh, and Matheson said we were demoralized. Mm -hmm. uh, he said after, even though it wasn't perfect in the first two periods, we we had answers, but in the third, we seemed demoralized and we didn't have any answers anymore. Uh, and through all that, you got the captain, who's always, who always uh, seems to calm things down, put everything on a even, you know, even scale, and so that yeah, your teammates said this, your teammates said that. Yeah, but no, it was, you know, he, he, he likes to make sure that everything doesn't blow out of proportion. Yeah. But you could see it on the on the eyes. That whole third period, it was like they they turned from solid to liquid. And well, I don't uh, think the captain I don't think the captain liked that Motabu said he felt like the team gave up. I don't think Nick Suzuki liked that. That no. didn't seem to be didn't seem to be no. some a, a sentiment he sh he shared <laughs> with uh with his with his goalie. <laughs> No, no, I, it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. He had a different evaluation, but I don't know what's going to be the impact of that. You know, the, you br you brought up the the first game in November when you know they were nowhere to be seen. They lost all of their battles. They were they were terrible, and it, it triggered a portion of Martin Saint Louis coaching in the season where they had a huge focus on forecheck. Uh, So this time around, you, you said that at practice today, they didn't have that one aspect that they really focused on. But it, and I think that it's because the main aspect is psychological and you cannot, uh -huh. we cannot tell until the, maybe the outcome of the next couple of games, if it's going to be something that, that carries on or if it's just a one off. Sometimes a team lets down if they come back and next game they're out, they're, They're in the game. They're fighting and whatnot. Well, then it's got, it's inconsequential. But is if it's the start of something where, in terms of the morale of the group, it's been affected, then it's a different story. But it's been the Canadians have lost their last seven games at the Garden, and it's been a few occasions where, for in one way or another, they 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 got you know thrown out of the game at some point during those 60 minutes and ended up, you know, demoralized from, you know, in one aspect or the other. So mm -hmm. uh, it's it's it doesn't do them any good these days to go to the garden. And as a side note, I don't know if it was, if it was shown on TV, but the uh, the Bruins, you know, they're celebrating their centennial. And oh, uh, yeah, they showed that on TV. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> so honoring honoring that 1988 edition that finally broke the broke jinx, the jinx. Of, yeah. of 45 years of losing in the playoffs against Montreal. <laughs> it's I mean, it's only against Montreal on that night that they could have done that because play you know doing that ceremony against any other opponent would not have made any sense. But in exactly. front of those in in front of those fans, I mean. Back in 88, it meant something to them because it was like, we try against the Canadian, never works, never works. Mm -hmm. And it's the epitome of the, the, the Cam Neely era, of a healthy Cam Neely era. Cam Neely, Cam Neely single-handedly broke the jinx, I think, yeah. pretty much. He, yeah. he willed that team to break that jinx and was phenomenal every time he yeah. faced the Canadians in the playoffs. Like, Ray Bork was great all the time, obviously, but all the, time. the difference between regular season Cam Neely and... Playoff Cam Neely and playoff against the Canadians Cam Neely yeah. is just three different levels where the height, the height of that level is Cam Neely against the Canadians in the playoffs. And I thought, I mean, as far as pregame ceremonies go, I got to admit, like, I thought that was hilarious. I thought it was fantastic. They're showing this whole video, Bruins yeah, yeah, celebrating, yeah. beating the Canadians. And then at one point, the Hockey Night Canada cameras cut to the Canadians bench. And they're all like, oh, yeah, really? <laughs> Really, this yeah. is what's going. This is what's going on right now. And they're like, it's like, you know, you can see, you can see. I mean, it's, it's. I think it's, I think it's fine. Like, you know, no team in the NHL can complain less about pregame ceremonies and their content than the Canadians. They have no right mm -hmm. to say anything about anyone else celebrating their own history. You just have to sit there, shut up, and take it because for the number of teams that have had to go through elongated you know, ridiculously serious ceremonies prior to Canadians games. They had to just sit there and take their medicine. I thought it was, I thought it was quite funny. I really thought yeah. it was hilarious. <laughs> well, even if you'd argue that all the ceremonies presented by the Canadians were relevant and of the proper length, you could add up all the Molson cups presentations <laughs> one yes. after the other And exactly. that's a lo much longer ceremony yeah, yeah. than that's what about, the Bruins did. That's, that's, I've spent roughly two days of my life watching <laughs> Molson Cup presentation ceremonies that I'll never get back. No. Once a no. month for five minutes. So I don't, even, I don't really want to do the math, but yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I went to Gallagher after the game and I said, I, I mean, you're a veteran on this team. You know the Canadians' history, their rivalry. Is it, did you take it as part of your motivation in getting into this game? The fact that it had a bit of a taunting effect to it. He said, "Honestly, I was not even aware of that jinx. I learned it while we while I was on the ice." So no, <laughs> so it goes to show. Yeah. At some point, the passing of time it must mean something for for old uh, old schmucks like us. But uh, yes, exactly, exactly. Not so much for these well, guys. I was. Uh... I was 12 when they broke that jinx. I remember that series quite well. I, I oh, yeah. quite distinctly. It was very, very disappointing as a kid. Um, yeah. Listen, just before we move on to to the Lane Hudson portion of your weekend, I love that we're doing an entire episode just on your weekend. But um, let's address a little bit of Canadians news that happened on Monday. So Justin Barron was sent down to the Laval Rocket. Uh, the right. Canadians called up Arbor Jackye from the Laval Rocket, um, which I think was always part of the plan. Um, Yeah, we discussed it it's, last week. We did, exactly. And so it's it's not a surprise necessarily, but mm. it's it's I think Baron should be able to look at this and say, well, they sent Jack Eye down and he's come back up after making improvements to his game. So I don't need to take this as anything more than that. And I think it's a good precedent for them to send, because sending Jack Eye down was not easy and it 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 was definitely not easy on Arbor like we both spoke to him about it and and how he sort of psychologically had to process that and how it was difficult for him um but came out the other side has been playing great hockey was a great teammate in Laval yeah so now it's going to be on Justin Barron to go down there and do the same thing you know and be a good teammate but I'm very curious to see because you know we last last episode we talked about Caden Gooley moving to the right side which frees up some room on the left side Well, now you lose Justin Barron, and you add a lefty. <laughs> so now it's, again... It's going to be Harris on the right it, side. You're going to have two lefties on the right side. If they other... yeah, Unless Kovacevic comes be, in. That's it. And then you call up Jack Eye to, have his, to be seventh defenseman? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, that's... I don't, I don't get... I don't know. I don't know. So they we're going to find... 
they could play 7D because they also sent Stephens on. They put Stephens on waivers. If he clears, uh, I mean, he'll go down. Either there. they play 11-7 or they they magically find, you know, uh, uh, Sandman because. Or 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 Pearson's ready to come back. That's the other thing too. Well, but he's yeah, but he's not a centerman. I mean, that's the fact remains is that without Stevens, they got three centermen on the roster. So it would lend itself Maybe. to playing eleven seven. You're right. I think that's 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 not a not a bad point. Um, but yeah, it's it's I'm I'm extremely curious to see because the ironic thing here is that you know I asked Nick. I, the same thing I talked to you about with the Boston game. I asked Nick Suzuki at practice on Monday with the same question. You know, the last time you came out of that game in Boston, you had that singular focus on on the forecheck. What do you think is – what do you think merits your singular focus now coming off not only the game in Boston but the game in Ottawa as well? And he chose D-zone coverage. And he said, you know, I think – what we're doing on the D zone, we don't play D zone like every other team. I personally think the way we play it is more effective, but it does lend itself to guys not being on the same page and, and guys just not doing the same thing or thinking the same way. So we need to tighten that up. When we do it well, I think it's better than a typical man-to-man or a typical zone, uh, this hybrid the Canadians play, but but it does lend itself to, to miscommunication or, or just wires getting crossed. Um so as Nick Suzuki identifies that, what was the primary thing Arbor Jack was sent to Laval to work on? Was his D zone coverage? <laughs> it's literally yeah. this thing. So uh, we'll see what kind of improvements he's made in that regard and whether he's, but, you know, considering where the team is at in terms of that, that specific aspect of the game, um, it's just, it's just a, I guess a, a bit of a storyline or something to follow uh, once. Cause I can't imagine they called up Jack. I did not play. Exactly. Why would they, yeah, why yeah. would they do that? So let's see, let's see how he does. But uh, you know, I think his, his experience in Laval is a good lesson to a lot of the young players that are going to be coming through the Canadian system that are already here. Now, Joshua was living it right now. And, you know, we talked about it last episode, how I felt he should get back down a- ASAP. Mm-hmm. He's going to play on Tuesday. <laughs> Um, didn't look like he was verging on, on being sent back down. He was, he was practicing on a line with, with Yul Armia and Raphael Harvey Pinard on Monday, but Harvey Pinard was basically a placeholder for Monaghan who was getting treatment, which is something else that's worth noting how often he's getting treatment these days. And the, with the trade deadline six weeks away. Yeah. 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 Something, to, something thinking, to keep an eye on. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing during my long drive back from New York. <laughs> I had plenty of time to mull over things and, uh, yeah, that's true. We uh, we've seen. I mean, Monahan. It, it's ironic because he's missing a lot of days of practice for treatment. But when he plays right now, I mean, that line again against Boston in the first period, they mm-hmm. knocked at the door halfway in the first period, like a beautiful uh, passing exchange from from Armia to Roy to Monahan. Monahan really had an amazing opportunity. They, there's things are clicking be, between those three guys, mm-hmm. and Roy, as much as I expect him to be sent down at some point, we must he's recognize making it hard. That, he's making it he's hard. making it hard because he's yeah. not just surviving. You know, it's always that same thing. If you survive, you, we're going to be able to tell, and you're going to be down. Ba- you're yeah. going to be back in the AHL in no time. But he's not surviving. He's mm-hmm. he's he's right in there. So I mean, look. That guy was drafted in the fifth round because of work ethic issues. But in terms of talent, he's a top top two rounds type of guy. He's a top sixty talent. For the first his overall draft pick year. in the Q- QMJHL. I mean, his exactly. first overall pick. It's not. It's not like yeah. he was. You know, he didn't completely forget everything that made him a first overall pick in the Q. You know. That's right. So if he's twenty years old and he gets to g- play his first few games in the NHL at twenty, and he's a he's a you know, top two rounds type of talent at the NHL level. That's not outrageous. It's not out of the ordinary. And if he shows that he belongs, while well, he continues to get better while playing with better players. The day that'll mm-hmm. catch up to him, they'll send him down. But for the time being, you know, I remember in our previous conversation, you said that the Rocket was making a push to make the playoffs. I agree with that. But yeah. now they get some help. If Stephens is not is not claimed on waivers, he'll he'll help this the Rocket. 
And for them to have Roy or to have Stephens, it's almost equally useful. It's mm -hmm. not at the NHL level, their impact's not the same, but for the Rocket, it's pretty much on par. Oh no, Mitch Stevens is, is a top center for them for sure and was was a big loss when he when he yeah. left. Uh but you know, losing Jack High is a big deal. You know, I mean he's been playing excellent hockey. Him, the pairing with Mayu, Mayu has been thriving ever since Jack High's been there. So I mean that's really um that's really the 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 impact of 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 Monday's moves on the Rocket, in my eyes, is not only do you lose Jack High, but you lose the guy that was helping Mayu really figure something out and really find something. So it's going to be interesting to see how, if he's able to keep that going without Jack High next to him. Uh, but they have a big week coming up. I mean, you know, they've, they've moved up the standings significantly, you know, sweeping the Belleville Senators over the weekend, uh, mm -hmm. put them into a tie with them, I think in fourth in their division, but they have Utica who's kind of in the bottom, and, but then they have Syracuse and Rochester, two teams they're chasing um, on the road this weekend. And so it's, um, it's a big weekend for them, you know? And so let's see, it's, you know, that game is in Syracuse on Friday. So if Joshua Roy plays the game on Thursday, I don't see how he can play that game on Friday. Like, I don't see how it's, it just, it's, it, it would be basically committing to him staying for the weekend. So, but there's still yeah, a lot of season but, left in the HL. It's not, a, it's not as if it's a, it's a critical time for them, but it's, um, but you know, credit no. to Joshua Roy. I, th I thought he was, I thought he was really good on Saturday. You know, despite the circumstances, I thought he played a really good game. He's, he's making it tough to take him out of the lineup, let alone send him down. Yeah. And I mean, it's still January. I don't think that the, 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 the rocket playoffs as, as, as much as the organization wants them to, wants to see them in the playoffs is not the priority right now. Roy's line is the, is clearly the second most effective on the, mm -hmm. on the Canadians team. And on some nights, they're the most effective team, uh, most effective line. So he's part of that, and he's not outmatched. So let's see how long he can carry that. Um, because other, you got guys that have been there for much longer than him who are less impactful, you know? So, yeah. uh, I mean, Yesu Olonen has been, has been scratched lately. I mean, that guy frustrates me, man. I mean, he's got he's got so many. Uh, you can tell that I'm a bit delirious today, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little I bit. Don't <laughs> that guy, yeah. that guy frustrates me, man. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's, it's just it, it's because he's got so many tools, right? He's he's tall, he's fast, he's got amazing hands. Uh, he's got a lot going for him, but mm -hmm. he's he's not the sum of all of his parts because he should be a much better forechecker than he is. Uh, yeah. He should be. He should be on top of the opponent uh, opponents a lot more than he is. Uh, he should be driving inside the play inside the dots a lot more. He should use his shots more. He should be able to take his his time to not get rid of the puck so quickly and and take the time to read around him and, and choose what's the best play. There are many things in terms of uh, and also Marty mentioned the fact that what is off the puck game where it's trying to. To take away the puck or or helping the D's or whatnot, the, it, it, it's been subpar. So you yeah. put all that together, and you say, "Well, this is the guy that you see flashes in games. You know, three or four moments. So, oh, okay, that's why they drafted him. That's why he could be an NHL player. But over the long run, he's he's just not the sum of all his parts. Yeah, I mean, I think the argument could be made that he hasn't gotten a lot of runway to, to, to play in a role that's more appropriate to a guy that has all the skill sets, the skill set that you just described. Mm -hmm. um, I, you, could, you could easily, the counter argument would be, well, he hasn't earned that runway, which is fair. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's, you know, uh, if someone didn't hear who you were talking about right now, they would think you were describing Yol Armia. Like it was basically everything you just said, Applies yeah. to Yol Armia. I don't want a general. Yeah. It's not a general Finnish thing. It just happens that these two Finnish guys on the team have the same sort of trait to them. But but having said that, Yol Armia, we're getting good. We're getting good Yol Armia right now. Like like oh, a yeah. consistent stretch of like good Yol Armia and good Yol Armia is really good. So yeah. um, so good on him for being able to uh, to put together a stretch of of good game. Yes. Yeah, quick, quick note on Armia. Quick question for you. Um, 
Because obviously, whenever you mention the fact that he's got a good game, fans on Twitter will say, aha, it's, it's raising his trade value. How long uh, does he have to play like this in order to gain any trade value? This season, he's not getting traded this season. There's no way. There's no chance. They're not trading him by the deadline. I, they could. They might be able to trade him at the draft. If he plays this way from now until the end of the season, yeah, you could It'd maybe trade him. until the he end could, of the year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd have to be, it would have to be this from now on. And then, mm -hmm. and then maybe trade him at the draft, but more likely trade him as a rental at next deadline. Like that's because even, you know, at his number, even a solid, what, 35 games or so, Um, well, he's already played like five, so let's say 40, like half a season. <laughs> no, no, I mean, he's played like five good games, right? He's had like a stretch of like five good games already. So from now till yeah, the end maybe. of the season, it would be like half, he played half the season really well, which would be mm -hmm. pretty remarkable. And, and, and honestly, kudos on him if he's able to do that for a guy who started the year in Laval, who started at the low of the low. And, and people, you know, people I think, like to describe Armia as this guy who's aloof just because he's not very, he doesn't express himself very well in the media. It's, he's kind of camera shy. He's not really an outgoing type of personality, but he is an intensely competitive person and, and has a very high standard for himself. And there's like, there's, there's a lot of aspects of Yola Armia that, that don't come through when he speaks publicly. You just have to ask his teammates about it and, and, and they'll, and they'll tell you right away. Like this is the guy who takes his job extremely seriously. And when he's not playing well, It eats at him maybe too much. I mean, that's 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 something he yes. needs to work on. It's it's to his detriment how much he cares. Um, but but yeah. So if he's able to put together a half season where he's playing like this consistently, which frankly he has not done since playing for the Canadians, he's never put together 40 games like that look like the last five games we've seen from Real Armia. So if he does that, it'll be somewhat unprecedented, but it would definitely make it easier. Uh, to unload that contract, but even then, at the draft, that's that's still a reasonably high price to pay for a guy who's essentially a fourth liner on on a on a good team, you know. And but really high end penalty killer as well. But he's a role player. Role players making more than three million dollars are pretty pretty rare in today's NHL. Yeah. So it's it's tough. It's a tough trade, but Except you never that say. Good Armia, in, good Armia is better than a fourth liner. That's the thing. You you put him on the yeah. fourth line, waiting for the good games from Armia. But when he's good, Armia, he's as good as anybody on the team. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 fair. But there's not a GM in the league who's going to acquire Yol Armia thinking I'm getting a good Armia all the time. Even if he no. plays, even if he plays good Armia till the end of the season, everyone knows this guy's book, right? It's like it's you're getting your. You're acquiring an immensely talented player with incredible hands, good physical uh, tools, um, excellent in close quarters, um, really good at getting pucks back. Uh, lots of lots of high qualities. Except you have to accept the fact that every now and then, for three or four games, he's just going to float. <laughs> like it's just like it's. But the one good thing about Yol Army, I will say, like the last time, the longest stretch of good Army we've seen is the 21 playoff run where he was good Armia from the beginning of the playoffs to the end every night. Well, that earned him that contract that earned him that contract. Um, yeah. It, it, Earn is doing a lot of heavy lifting there, but it, it got him that contract. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, yes. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I mean, I think that's part of the reason why Bergeron felt compelled to give it to him is because the way he played in the playoffs probably, got a lot of GM's attention. I don't know if he needed to give him that specific contract, but I think there was going to be comp competition for his services based on how he performed in the playoffs that year. So, yeah. so in that mm -hmm. sense, in terms of his trade value, there might be some GMs still out there who remember that and be like, okay, well, when the stakes are highest, this guy shows up. I can use that on my team, you know? Yeah. So, but we'll see. It's uh, yeah. not outside the realm of possibility. Um, so, yeah, so just let's finish with your weekend because, <laughs> um, because, you know, Jack Eye coming up in the whole log jam on the left side, obviously Lane Hudson is, is, is going to be a future part of that left side of the defense. Maybe, probably, let's say, um, a lot of excitement over this guy. So I believe, uh, you know, you were in Burlington on Friday evening. Yeah. Um, I know that and I so had were a, a lot. 
So were a lot of Canadian Well, that's friends. the thing. Like, I had a buddy of mine, like, two months ago, asked me, like, hey, do you want to go to BU's playing at UVM on the weekend of January 19th? Like, you want to go? I was like, no, I don't want to go, man. It's, it's, it's like, it's like that's, that's work for me. It's just, you know, like, yeah, yeah, but it'll be fun, whatever. And anyhow, ultimately, he didn't go, but he, like, even, it was even on his radar. Like two months ago or a month and a half ago. So yeah. So what was the what was the scene like at um in Burlington? Like was it was it like just an embarrassing amount of Canadians fans or what what was what was it like? Because I know on uh, Thursday there was an embarrassing amount of Canadians fans in Ottawa, and I was I was astonished oh, yeah. at how many. But that's normal. Yeah. That's how many normal. how many Canadians fans were at the UVM game? I would say probably. It's hard to tell because I'm not familiar with gauging. Give me a percentage. Side. Give me a percentage of the crowd. Oh, easily ten percent. Okay. Okay. That's there, there. There are many, many dozens. Right. Uh, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Many dozens. I would say probably. A, I would say maybe a hundred and fifty people. A lot of people speaking French. And when you walk through the people, you. You're closer to them, and you you recognize all oh, this one's got a he's got a toque with a Canadians uh, logo on it. Mm -hmm. uh, then oh, you got these other guys. That were, there were five guys having their T-shirts with with Hudson's face printed on it, and one had it was written "Life," the other one "In the Fast Lane." Yeah. So uh, so they, they they had their little theme going on. Um, and yeah, so plenty plenty of Montreal Canadiens fans. So the guys in the in BU's locker room said it's funny because because we're playing a new way game for everybody except for Lane. Yeah. Lane's well, playing a, a home game. Yeah. So that's really what it looked like. And he gave a show. Um but it more especially on the power play. And it got me thinking because it's clearly he's a guy that can run a power play with the best of them. He's going to be really impactful in that department. Um But I'm curious to which extent he's going to be able to produce a lot of offense five on five, you know, and if the if he's able to recalibrate his, his production so that it's mostly five on five and the power play stuff is an interesting add on because you mm -hmm. don't want a, a guy that, you know, he can wow you with the number of points that he gathers. But if 60 percent of them, I don't have the, ex the exact percentage. I don't know. It's really. I'm making it up. But if, as an example, if you get 60% of your points that are made on the power play, uh, then it's not the same as 60% were made five on five. You, you have to be, have a guy who's able to contribute offensively five on five. Well, I think, I think you know, and you, you spoke to Jay Pandolfo. I spoke to him a, a while ago in December. And, mm -hmm. and remember what Nick Bobrov said when they drafted him. You know, this is a big brain. We drafted a big brain. This is what, you know, he's small body, big brain. And so, you know, you, you look at his, his ability to adapt and he's had to adapt his whole life, right? Because he's, he's been small. And, you know, I think you wrote in your piece that he's up to 160 pounds, which, which to me is, I mean, he can play in the NHL at 160. It was, it's like, it's not, it, it won't be easy, but he can do it. It's, it's, he's no longer at a weight that is inconceivable that he would play in the NHL. But because of that, he's had to adapt his whole life. And I think changing levels to the NHL level, and you talk about the five on five, I, I, I just think he'll adapt. You know, like it's, yeah. it's, he's, he knows what his skill sets are. He knows what his limitations are. He's always adapted based on those two data sets or just those two markers that I can do this and I know I can't do this. So how do I find a way in, in between to, get what I need to do what I need to do to get what I yeah. get done, what I need to get done. And so, you know, I believe, I mean, just the power play impact alone will be, and, and I'm, just, I'm curious, does BU use the drop pass on the power play to, to yes, enter the they zone? Do. They do. They do. So he yeah. gives up the puck. He skates it up and, and drops it to someone else to enter the zone. Yeah. Because he, like, yeah. he strikes me as a guy that you could bypass the whole drop pass thing. Or he could actually receive the drop pass. 
and, oh, yeah. and enter, and sure, enter the zone. Both. You know, like he so, could do both. But yeah. there was one instance where he did like Mike Madison against New Jersey, where he faked the, the drop pass and decided to keep it and try to get in by himself. Well, I just uh, he would be a zone entry machine. I would think at the NHL. No I mean, doubt. It's like, it's no so doubt. So that would be that would that's be the a, transition. The transition game is is off the charts. Yeah. That's that's the most ex- exciting thing. I think it, because and he uses his edges so well, and, and he's got all of this assortment of of deeks and 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 fakes. Is, that's just very spectacular to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, we we spoke to his coach, and he, he thinks that those skills are translatable. Um, Cole Caulfield the other day said also after watching him a lot in the World Juniors that what his skill set. Can fit in, in in the NHL just as well. To me, the offensively, what I'll find interest, interesting once he graduates to the NHL, well, how long will it take him? Because he'll adapt. I'm, I'm I agree with you. How long will it take him to gauge the the risk management? Because he's a guy who likes to play with a certain amount of risk because uh-huh. he knows that where there's risk there's benefit and he wants to get major benefit so it's but he's he's been learning to just identify the proper amount of risk but that that spectrum that chart is not divided the same way in the NHL than it is at the NCAA level because there are things that he does now that he won't be able to do at the NHL level because yeah. he'll put him himself at risk so how long will it take him to adjust to that That's going to be interesting, and to me, it's it's going to be probably more impactful or more significant to his career than the fact that he's he doesn't have the proper weight. Well, Because he couldn't weight. He's he's never had the proper weight, and he's always had to he always had to figure other ways to to distinguish himself and to be effective. He's managed so far. I don't see why he could not do it in the next level either. And and as far as the risk management goes, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better mentor in that regard than Mike Matheson. People might hear that and say, well, he's not a very good at risk management. He's not. It's not a strength in his game, but I mean, he, he, he also is pretty good at getting rewards out of that risk, but that balance, you know, he don't, you don't want to take all the risk out of someone like Lane Hudson's game, but you do want to calibrate that risk reward gauge and yeah. It took Mike Madison like five years to properly calibrate it once he made the NHL. Um, you know, his basically his entire time in Florida, he struggled with that. So, you know, I think from time to time now you see him kind of revert back to that and take an unnecessary risk or a risk that doesn't work out. Listen, we call them unnecessary risks when they don't work. You know, I think there's a number <laughs> there's a number of times when Madison takes a risk. And and it works. You're like, oh wow, what mm-hmm. a great what a great play. But no one's like no one's like, hey, that was that was really risky for no reason. You're like, wow, it's, that's that's yeah. you're making plays. So um so yes, yeah, on occasion his risks don't work and they, they come off as mistakes. But I mean, if you know if if there's one guy who would understand that challenge that you just described for Lane Hudson, like there are very few guys, especially considering he's coming out of Madison came out of the NCAA. In Boston, not the same school, but still like in the same environment. Yeah. You know, it's it's. Um, he has good. those. He had those traits back then too at Boston 100, College. hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so. I spoke to to Coach Brown over there when I was there. He was asking about Matheson how mm-hmm. he was, and and he said, "Oh yeah, he he, he was he was mistake prone because of the, the amount of risk that he was taking, but it was just paying off so much, you know." And yeah. with the Canadians, it, it pays off. I find, and just going back quickly to, to, to Barron, I think that the difference between Matheson and Barron is that they have the same amount of risk. It's just that the reward for Matheson is so much greater right now. Yeah. You know, so that's. And, and Barron's, Barron's young, you know, Barron's got, got a lot to learn. And then it's, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's, I mean, I think with Barron, it's, it really is the D zone stuff that he's, you know, he's losing guys in the defensive zone very often. It's, uh, It's a tough, it's a tough one for him. I think, I think that's, he's probably got a very similar mandate in Laval as Arbor Jack I had in terms of mm-hmm. go clean up your diesel. Okay. Right. So we got a few minutes for some mailbag questions. There were a bunch of them. Uh, a lot of them actually kind of geared towards the defense, but we'll close with that. We'll open with a question from John Wright. Um, who's reacting to our podcast following the Kent Hughes presser, which was a week ago, Monday. And, um, 
said, one of the topics was extracting value from a Jake Allen trade and likely how little value the Habs could expect in return. It got me thinking, A, why not put Allen on waivers instead of Primo, as Primo will get scooped up? And B, wouldn't it be better come trade deadline to have that additional $3.85 million in cap space after relieving yourself of Allen's cap hit than a pick likely to be in the fourth round or later? Like, why wait? I understand the rationale behind asset management, but unless you see Allen being packaged with another player for a stronger return, why not just offload him for the cap dump? What is the point in keeping him outside of mentorship? Thanks, John. Do you think Jake Allen would get picked up on waivers if he was placed on waivers? I actually don't, but what do you think? No, because no, for, not because he's not good enough. It's just a salary thing. That's it. A salary has to come so, back. Right. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not sure that any of the teams that need a goalie have the, the have the room to add on that salary right now. No. So, but at the same time, his salary is not a problem, and it's you know say oh adding some more cap space. The Canadians have ton of cap space with with the LTIR, so it's never going to be an issue. No. Uh, I think that the only reason why they would absolutely want to move Allen is because they think that it's a deterrent to Primo's development. Uh, because as long as those three goalies are going to be there, they're all going to see action. Uh, Montembeau, I expect, will will have probably a higher percentage of games in the second half of the season, but it, it will surely affect Primo. Um, I think Montembeau is going to get like two out of three games. And and yeah. Primo and Allen are going to have to like split that third game, kind of. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. It's going Which to be. Uh, not and a great even situation. if he gets only fifty, even even if he gets fifty, it's going to be like fifty, twenty-five, twenty-five, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't know. For me, it's it. The Canadians are better off when when the reader says, you know, there's a, the listener, uh, says that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we could. They could also package him with another player. I think that's that's certainly an avenue worth considering. Yeah, uh, it means it means taking an even bigger salary back because you would you would package two players. But well, we talked about it last sake, last episode. We talked about Allen and Savard getting packaged together. I guess as, that's it. Or as, it could be as like, an idea. Allen, yeah, or Allen and Monaghan. You yeah. know, uh, it's, it, generally. It's those. It's funny because the teams that that are looking for these for uh, for a goaltender are also have this. They seem to be very often the same type of teams that could use a Monahan or a Savo. So mm-hmm. um, that's a that's a possibility. But to me, it's just the urgency. I'd rather if they have to wait until the last day to say, okay, today here's the market for our goalie. Not every team that looks for a goalie will find one before the trade deadline. So the more patient you have, the more the, you are, the, the the likelier you are to, to get the price that you want. And if the floor is a fourth round pick or whatever, if 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 the value is what it is now and it doesn't get increased, well, you'll take what you're you're offered at the right, you know, at, at the on the last day because you couldn't do any better. Yeah. But the, what what are the Canadians really losing by waiting a bit more? I mean, Primo has already taken a significant step uh, forward with very limited action this year, but he's he's more. Well, that would be the benefit. Than, yeah, that would be the benefit of, of acting now. Would be you 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 loosen this logjam, and so when we talked about when we say oh, Montable might get two out of every three games, well, that means Primo gets one out of every three games. Or if he's, mm-hmm. Montable, you know, if Montable is getting 60% of the games and Primo will get 40 instead of 20. And so that would be the only benefit that, that, that they could give Primo some more, some more games. But again, I don't sense the level of desperation for the Canadians to move Allen being that high necessarily. So no. And if you send him to the, uh, the AHL, you kill his value also. So who? Oh, Allen. Allen. You mean if he gets through waivers? Yeah. Well, I don't think they would send well, him to the. I don't think they would send him to the HL. They would just. Well, first of all, they would not. Free? Well, they wouldn't put him on waivers if they didn't know for for a fact that someone was going to pick him up. Like I, I remained convinced that the Canadians were fully cognizant yeah, of the fact that Gus Gus Lindstrom was going to get picked up by the Ducks. So they put him on waivers, and and the Ducks picked him up. I don't know why they did that. 
<laughs> but it seems pretty obvious to me that, that they knew that that was going to happen. Like it's the timing of it was weird. Like they wait yeah. for the Jamie Drysdale trade to happen and immediately put a right shot D on waivers just basically hand delivering him to the ducks. Like there's, there's some sort of arrangement was made there. Something anyhow. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to other questions. We have three more. So hopefully we'll try to get through all three. They're all pertaining to uh, defense. So we'll start with uh, David Gauthier Dussereau. Dussereau. Yeah, I think that's right. D- um, du- well, D-U-S-S-U Dussereau. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's, the way it's, that's the way it's spelled here. Um, sorry, David, if, that, oh, yeah. if, I, if I'm saying that wrong. But uh, everyone knows the Canadians need and want to add high-end forwards. If that's to be acquired by a trade and the target is really a high-end talented forward, which of Gouli or Ryanbacker do you think will be expended? Um, you know, obviously, you know, David recognizes in an ideal world you keep both, but you have to give to get. So if it came down to those two, because we all know, you know, there were some questions in, in our inbox about uh, what do you, if, the, if they, you know, the, these are older questions, but do you think the Canadians were in on Cutter Gauthier? And the answer to that question is probably not because what the Flyers would want for Cutter Gauthier, the Canadians already said no to, which was Ryan Backer. So those discussions probably wouldn't go very far unless unless the Flyers were interested in Gouli, which I don't think they would be. Um, it's not really a Drysdale level uh, talent, um, or at least doesn't bring the same the same skills. But anyhow, let's say they had to trade a high-end defenseman to get a high-end forward. It's clear that Gouli or Reinbacker would be the two targets any team would, would identify. Which one do you think is easier to give up on? Man, that's tough. Uh, Gouli is more of a known quantity so it's when you know exactly what you what what you get out of him it's um i think it's harder to 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 partake with a to to separate from a guy like that yeah uh but ryan backer you it's you cannot trade ryan backer without knowing what he's going to be like you know they they drafted him because they thought he would be a top pairing guy let's say number two defenseman yeah If he, you know, you mentioned uh, the comparisons to Noah Dobson. You don't, uh, right now, it's not because he's got a meh season in Switzerland on a, on a team that's bad, uh, that once you bring him here in three, four years, he's a very, very good defenseman. Uh, you know, it, it could be, think of uh, Sanderson in Ottawa. When he was drafted, he was, he was touted as a very good defenseman, but not necessarily extraordinary, but they, they're happy to have him. Uh, so there's a similar vibe around Sanderson as there is around Rybacker for sure. Yeah. 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 To Definitely. Me, so it's, to me, it's, it's a similar level. Um, so it, honestly, man, did you, uh, that's terrible. I, it's, it's well, terrible it's not terrible. Choice. I mean, it's a terrible choice, but I mean, you know, if you're getting, uh, you know, I think, you know, let's the say, let's is, say, let's say Anaheim, let's say Anaheim makes Trevor Zegers available, for example. Like that's, yeah. I think that's where this conversation originates is, you know, would you trade Caden? Would you include Caden Gooley in a trade for someone like Trevor Zegers? And, and no, so I would, not. I would not, well, that's it, you know? And I think actually Max, Maxim LaPierre had a good tweet on that. He's like, he's like, I could sum it up like this. Trevor Zegers is the type of guy who disappears in the playoffs when he's matched up against a guy like Caden Gooley. <laughs> that was like, that was, he's like, oh, that's the summary of that whole trade debate. But let's say, so let's say, not Trevor Zegers, let's say someone who had a more complete game, who was a more sure thing as like a high-end offensive player. Um, like Brady Kachuk, for example? You know? No, like, not like Brady me. Kachuk. No, no, no. Like <laughs> someone who's who's, who's unproven. Uh, you, yeah. know, you know, I mean, Cutter Gauthier being, being an example, I suppose. But, uh, you know, someone – it's it's – The thing with Reinbacker and Gouli is I feel like Gouli's floor is higher and he's always been a high floor guy. Like everyone always knew Caden Gouli was going to play in the NHL for a long time. It was guaranteed. Yeah. You knew that. It was just how high can his floor be and, and his ceiling be and his ceiling is still in question. You know, like I don't know if he's ever going to be a big offensive guy, which has always been the question with him. Uh, mm-hmm. 
but that's fine. You know, I mean, he's he's showing. And it, what's interesting here is is so I I asked Marty at practice on Monday about him playing on the right side, which obviously we talked about on Friday. So I'm not going to get too into it. But one thing that Marty said that 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 struck me was like, obviously, this is not ideal. You know, this is we would rather not yeah. be doing this. So, you know, when we were kind of surmising, oh, maybe Keaton Gooley has a future on the right side. I don't know if the Canadians see it that way. You know, I think this is a stopgap. This is a temporary solution, and they would rather not have that be Caden Gooley's future in the, in yeah. the organization, I, you know. Right. At least St. Louis sees it that way. Uh, and I had asked him about that after after first game on the right side. That was against uh, Edmonton. Yeah. And uh, after the game, I had asked him, and he said, oh, yeah, it's, it's great. It's give a, give a, it gives us flexibility. But in an ideal world, I'd rather have three lefty, three righty. So I said, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, yeah, it's true. It's, that's Marty's point of view. Maybe management sees it differently, but I mean, it's. Um... But to, just to answer uh, David's question, I'm not even sure if acquiring a, a top end talent at forward, like a top six type of forward, will necessarily mean giving up on a young defenseman. I understand where they're, the, 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 where they the, 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 the the quality and and really the the more resources the Canadians have, it's their it's their pipeline on defense. I get that, but it's also where they know that they can build the strongest. That's that's that that that's where they can build a wall. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get rid of big piece already, when you don't necessarily know what you have in any of those cases, it's risky. So I think that. You know, down the road, if they were to, they have a plenty of first round picks. They could they could give up a ton of first round picks. They could choose to go at at some point to in the um, uh, the uh, what do you call it <laughs> the uh, not free agent route, but uh, the offer sheet route. Mm -hmm. You know, why not? Uh, the Canadians don't have their second round pick for next year's draft, but just just the the possibilities, right? I don't think that it necessarily has has to be uh, the, the giving up on one of their defensemen. Certainly not those two. I think that there's, there was another question of who would be. Uh, it was uh, Olivier Paquet Thibodeau who was asking us, you know, who are if you had to choose a top four core among those young defensemen, who would that be? Well, Gouli and R Reinbacher, to me are part of it. Yeah. Hudson is part of it, and Jack Eye is part of it. But that remain. You still have Mayu as a trading chip. You still have Struble as a trading chip. You still have a bunch of other guys that could, in due time, pop up and become like significantly good defensemen. Not necessarily like the as good or as valuable as that top four, but trading chips. Well, you're not. So, yeah, but you're not getting. You're not getting a high end offensive forward by packaging. Jordan Harris and Logan Mayu and and you know you have to give up if if you give if you give two okay and people I'm again I'm I'm making this up this is not a trade proposal uh, to, but if you give up two first round picks and Logan Mayu you're gonna have, you know it not not now because Logan Mayu still has to convince other teams but a year or two years from now you give up two first round picks and Logan Mayu you're gonna get something very valuable I think. You know, it doesn't have to be necessarily Gooley or Reinbacker. I, if I if I'm the GM, those are the guys I hold on to. Okay, well, that's better fair. or for worse. I would I would agree with that. I think the most interesting. We're going to end with this. It's uh, came from Louis Francois Charpentier. Um, I'll just read. I'll just read the question. It's a little long, but that's okay. So, since the Canadians drafted Hudson last year and now Reinbacker, the fan base and organization. Seem to be very hopeful of the future on defense and for good reason. We fancy the idea of having a pair with a dynamic offensive D in Hudson and an efficient large defenseman to play big minutes in Rhinebacker. We also have good depth playing in Montreal right now, and we see the Mayu and Jackai are doing great things in Laval. While these are all positives and we think they'll pan out in the future, I'm starting to think that we may be blurred at the moment to what the future entails. Gooley promises to be a top defensive defenseman, maybe a second or third D-man at best, in my opinion. Um, he's still young, 
and I believe he will pan out, but he's been struggling a bit this year. The other defensemen do not have such a high floor. Mayu, Struble, Kovacevic, Harris, Barron, to me, will never be more than a fourth defenseman on a good team. My question is the following. We have volumes of second, third pairing potential defensemen and are hoping that Rhinebacker, Hudson, and Gouley can be for sure in your top two pairs. Aren't we hoping for a bit too much? We don't have the Owen Power Dalin combo here, and I think that the volume of players of potential solid second, third pairing D is clouding the reality. Isn't the future at D weak in high end talent? Thanks. That's an interesting thought. I, I it's it really uh, is. It's, yeah, I like that because I like that. You know, it's it's again, it's not um, volume doesn't necessarily make it. It's actually the problem with their entire prospect pool is the high end talent is not there. There's lots of volume. They have lots of prospects, mm. and so I think it's similar in this case. As to what, you know, it's, it's the volume. The hope is that the volume will lead to quality. Like that, that one or two out of this group will emerge into something greater than we see them as. And it was funny when we were talking to JF Hull about Arbor Jacka, you know, what did he say? He's like, once this guy gets comfortable, he's going to start doing things we don't think he can do. Like it's, it's, and, and so in his eyes, he sees potential in Jacka that maybe, the Canadian organization doesn't necessarily see in him right now. And, and that, that he can, that can be brought out of him at a later date. And so, you know, I agree that right now there aren't any obvious, there aren't that many obvious top pair options among the defense group, but there's so many of them and they're so, they're, they're so good. There, there are so many clear, NHL caliber prospects that you have to imagine that one or two of them will elevate higher than what is expected of them. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah. And, and the margin, it's a luxury that, that talent pool that they've got on defense is not just the idea of the uh, throwing darts on the board uh, and, and hoping with the amount of picks that there's going to be players coming out of there. It's 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 a lot of legitimate NHL players that they will have. Mm -hmm. And so it's just hoping who are going to be the best ones in that group. It might not be that you build you won't have a uh a, a Dalene and Power duo. I agree with that. But at the same time, yeah, they're, they're, they're two they're number they're one going, overall picks. I mean, it's you know. There's that. <laughs> yeah. But you could but But I think that a lot of people in hockey would trade that defense core right now for, let's say, the Carolina Hurricanes D core. And I think that the Canadians can have like four Jacob Slavins and Brett Pesci's and the types, you know, they, it's, it, I think it's geared more along that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they'll have, they have the luxury of choosing among a, 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 a group of very good young NHL defensemen. And it's a luxury. It it's not just it's not just hope decisions or hope plays. It's it's good choices, good problems to have. But it's true they don't have they don't have Victor Edmund. They don't have Larry Robinson out there. No. no. Okay, but Lane Hudson, what's his ceiling? You know. Well, I also I think, and I also think in, in building a defense core, like I don't think this is as true at the forward as a forward group, but like, like if you built a forward group of 12 players who are all like second line worthy forwards, you could probably, you'd probably be a pretty good team. So if you field six defensemen who are all top four caliber, like second pair caliber defensemen without being top, like prototypical number one defenseman caliber, but you can, you can roll out six guys that are all top four worthy. Um, I'm not sure what's the better. The, like, I mean, you might be better off that way. Like in terms of team building, you know, I mean, it, yes, you're going to lack like the superstar quality of it. You're not going to have a Kale McCarr or a Quinn Hughes or what have you. But as far as a team trying to get to a playoff run where injuries come in and everything like that, like it's, I don't know. I think, I think it could be, it could be a way to go about it. And I think the Canadians, if that's, You know, if that's the way that they see it, I mean, they're, they're pretty well set up to have a defense like that that's low on star power, but the floor is so high that the group of six that they put out on any given night would probably be better than 
most of the other defense cores that they would face. For sure. There could be a world where uh, Jaden Struble would be your number six guy. Yeah. And if he's your number six guy, no matter who's or the my, number or one you. guy in the change, or my you, yeah. no, who cares who's, who's labeled number one? If that guy is your number six, it's again, yes, it's, it's, it's a weak link type of building, but, or philosophy. But if those guys are your bottom pair, I think you'll be okay. Like, how great would it be? Like, how great would it <laughs> be to be, be okay. able to play like all six of your defensemen, uh, 15 minutes a game? Or I don't know. I can't, uh, maybe the math is wrong. Yeah, that is wrong. 20 minutes a game. Is that right? No. No, they're 15. all 20 minutes. Yeah. No, there, there's, there's six of them. There are two on the ice at the same time. It's six of them. Minutes. And there's six, six defensemen. There's 120 right? so, minutes to fill for defensemen. Yeah. So it'd be 20 minutes a game for all six defensemen. Yes. Is that, is that right? <laughs> they have six. No, look, there's 60 minutes in the game. Yeah. But right? there's two defense spots. Yeah. So that's 120 minutes of ice time. No, there. No, it remains 60 minutes. Because there's two of them at the same time. Oh my God. If they all play 20 minutes, then you're, you're, you've covered the whole game. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If, if, okay, good. <laughs> wow. What's the cliche these days among uh, po sports podcasters? <laughs> I was taught there would be no mass. Yeah, so let's, let's yeah, leave it at that. It. Let's that leave was... it at that, that little... Someone's, I'm sure people in the comments are going gonna, are gonna to mention our math, but I think some people out there know what I'm talking about. Okay. We're going to leave it at that. <laughs> Big week for the Canadians. Comeback game against yes. the Senators on Tuesday. we got Patrick Watt in the building on Thursday, and we will be talking to you on Friday. Uh, until then, enjoy your week. Welcome back home, Marc-Antoine. I think you deserve some rest. And thanks, everyone, for listening.